So that night, with the Yankees playing the White Sox in Chicago, they penciled into the lineup at cleanup for the first time all year, Alex Rodriguez. Alex Rodriguez about to take his first at bat of the season. So why don't you listen to the reception he'll get from the crowd. Number one for the New York, the third baseman, number 13, Alex Rodriguez. Certainly not a warm greeting from the crowd here in Chicago, and I guess what would you expect? He singled in that at-bat, going one for four overall, but the Yankees lost eight to one. They actually got swept in Chicago, falling to just one game over 500 and seven games back of the last wild card spot. Then the team returned to New York, and even there, the crowd reaction was, let's go with mixed. Now for the Yankees, batting fifth in the order, for third baseman, number 13, Alex Rodriguez, number 13. On Earth's second, two outs. So what do you think, Kenny? 50-50? 60-40? Yeah, you know, it sounded 50-50 to me. Yeah. But, the, the 50 but the Yankees to... needed Alex. As mentioned, the team had injuries up and down the lineup all year in 2013. But the lack of production from third base was particularly notable. They had only four home runs from that position prior to Rodriguez's return to the lineup. And within a couple of days, Alex and the team actually started to turn it around. Starting on August 11th, A-Rod hit in six straight games, beginning a period where the Yankees won 10 out of 12, pulling themselves to within three and a half of a playoff spot. This was a wild stretch for the team, which included a three-game series at Fenway Park against the first-place Red Sox, where, on a nationally televised game on ESPN's Sunday Night Baseball, Boston starter Ryan Dempster decided to take the league's disciplinary process into his own hands. His first pitch was 89 miles per hour aimed right at Alex's knees. And he actually missed, and the ball sailed behind A-Rod, but the crowd applauded Dempster for the effort. Pitches 2 and 3 were inside, not exactly close to hitting Alex, but clearly trying to brush him back. And then finally, on the last pitch with the count 3-0, and Dempster threw up and in at Alex, hitting him on the shoulder, but not missing his head by much. Warnings were issued to both sides, but Dempster was not thrown out of the game, which made Joe Girardi, the Yankee manager, irate. He stormed the field, screamed at the ump, and got thrown out of the game. The incident actually sparked a rally that put the Yankees ahead 3-2, but it was a really wild game. Later, A-Rod came up with with the Yankees trailing 6-3, and he had a home run that sparked a come-from-behind win for New York. It was a pretty emotional game for Alex and the whole team. Joe said that that should have been handled differently. The first pitch behind you should have been a warning, and then when you got hit, he should have been tossed. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I agree. I agree. That was... You know, whether you like me or hate me, that's just what's wrong is wrong. And that was unprofessional and silly. And uh, kind of a silly way to get somebody hurt on your team as well. Considering, you know, how many players have been spoken out about you playing through your suspension, are you concerned about this moving forward? I'm not at all. You know, we um, that today kind of brought us together. Joe's reaction was amazing. Uh, every single one of my teammates came up to me and said, you know, hit a bomb and walk it off. And they were more p- as pissed as I was. Oh, no, that's just not right. Do you think you should be suspended? Who? Uh, Ryan. I'm the wrong guy to be asking about suspension. <laughs> <laughs> Holy mackerel. That's what the well, yeah, 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 well, I got an attorney I can recommend. It's pretty. It's a pretty good bit for the league to just make throwing at Alex Rodriguez legal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get... Look, I get why Dempster did what he did, but it was. I, I also get why Girardi was... Like, it was so obvious what he was doing. He doesn't even get thrown out of the game. Come on. Yeah. For the Yankees, the shot in the arm. Maybe we shouldn't use that phrase. Artificial boost. Invigorating injection. <laughs> the unique cocktail of ingredients. The blend of, of force that Alex provided lasted only about a month. On September 12th, after 33 games, Rodriguez was slashing 294, 391, 504. His best one month stretch since his knee injury two years earlier. Even better, the Yankees had pulled to within just one game of playoff position. But that was as close as the Zoilo Almonte Yankees would get. 
In fact, the team kind of collapsed in the final two weeks. It started with yet another injury to Alex's lower half. There was a hamstring issue in Baltimore that relegated him to just being a DH for the rest of the year. Then he added a calf tweak a couple days later in Fenway Park. And while he stayed in the lineup, Alex only went 3 for 37 over the last two weeks of the season, seeing his overall numbers plummet. His batting average fell by 50 points, his on-base percentage by 43, and his slugging fell by a full 80 points in just 11 games. And this decline was felt throughout the lineup. The Yankees had averaged 5.6 runs per game in the first month after A-Rod came back, but that number fell to below 3 per game after his leg injuries. Starting with the series in Boston, the Yankees lost 9 of 12 games and ended the season 6.5 games back of the second wild card. Almost exactly where they had been when Rodriguez was first activated in August, missing the playoffs completely for the, for the first time since 2008. But even after the Yankees were eliminated, all eyes were on A-Rod, since his arbitration was scheduled to start just a day after the regular season ended. Alex expected this arbitration to vindicate him, to be the forum for him to finally tell his side of the story. And he really came out guns blazing. A few days after the hearing began, he filed a lawsuit against Major League Baseball, accusing them of, quote, tortious interference. Tortious is in tort law, but if you ask me, it was also torturous interference. (laughs) For paying for evidence against him in the steroid case. And it was true. They did do that. And as well as bullying witnesses, also true, they did that as well. The next day... Rodriguez sued the Yankee team doctor, Christopher Ahmad, for failing to diagnose his hip injury properly the previous October. Remember, that was the postseason where Alex was pinch hit for multiple times and ultimately benched because he looked so helpless and broken at the plate. Turns out he really was broken. (laughs) In addition to this legal strategy, Rodriguez also tried to win over the public. That fall, he took a meeting with the documentarian Billy Corbin in Miami, where he supposedly pitched the director on making a documentary about his unjust persecution. Corbin would make a documentary about the case, but uh, the the aforementioned screwball, but it was not flattering to A-Rod. A-Rod also astroturfed an organization called Hispanics Across America to organize a protest in his defense outside the arbitration hearing. Corbin would lampoon the fact that all of the signs the Hispanics across America held up seemed to be written in the same handwriting. Yeah, that protest became became sort of a running joke with people there not even really understanding, like they'd clearly been paid to be there and they didn't even know what they were doing there. In the actual arbitration hearing, though, Alex's defense centered on how unprofessional baseball's investigation had been, highlighting Bosch's lack of credibility and the tainted nature of the evidence against him pointing out that both the testimony of Bosch and the documents obtained had been bought and paid for. He also made a big deal out of an affair that the league's head of investigations had with one of the witnesses and tried to insist that Bud Selig was out to prove he was tough on steroids before retiring to atone for presiding over the steroid era in the first place. And there was some truth to what he was saying. But Rodriguez did not seem to realize until it was too late just how uphill his battle would be. He had already been caught lying about this. How could anyone believe him now? A-Rod would get no presumption of innocence, so it didn't matter that Major League Baseball had failed to meet that burden of proof. After all, they were the ones who decided what proof was enough. People will often both sides the biogenesis case, pointing out that A-Rod and the league both paid for evidence, they both sent money to Bosch, and they both lied about their behavior. And that's all true, but it ignores the fundamental imbalance of power here between labor and capital. Rodriguez wasn't the one issuing suspensions. The commissioner was serving as the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury in this process. And even though A-Rod was guilty, the investigation was more about protecting the league's image than protecting the players or protecting the rules. By making Alex's misconduct the focus of the story, baseball had managed to distract from the way Biogenesis poked holes in the narrative that baseball had been telling, that they had moved on from the steroid era. The testing system worked even though it failed to catch most of the players treated by Bosch. Steroids were out of the game, even though one broke hustler with no medical degree operating out of a strip mall in Miami was apparently treating over a dozen major leaguers. The league cared about player safety, even though they were actively impeding government efforts to prosecute a steroid dealer in order to procure his testimony against players. 
By blaming the players, baseball could ignore all those contradictions and insist that one more suspension, one more punishment, that would be the thing that finally fixed everything. The final straw for A-Rod came in mid-November as the hearing was winding down. Alex and his team were insisting that Bud Selig had to testify. After all, the suspension, the 211 game total, that had been Selig's decision, and it seemed like a reasonable request that Rodriguez be able to face his accuser. But on November 20th, the independent arbitrator, Frederick Horowitz, ruled that Selig did not have to testify. He didn't even have to attend the hearings. After that, A-Rod threw a fit, kicking over a briefcase, stormed out of the hearing, and headed all the way over to the WFAN studio where he sat for an extended 40-minute radio interview with Mike Francesa. Man, A-Rod loves sports talk radio. Yeah, and he specifically loves Mike Francesa. So in that, we he and I have a lot in common. It is true. Early on in the interview, Mike Francesa comments how frequently... Yeah, he's like, you're A-Rod always here. Did. He's like, you're here all the time. <laughs> Through the interview, he insisted on his innocence, demanded the right to confront Selig, and said the whole process was a sham, and he'd given up hope that he would ever be treated fairly. You know, it's been difficult, but, uh, you know, respecting the process, having been offered to to come in a million shows, haven't done anything, it's just been really just taking it one day at a time and respecting the process, and today I just, I lost my mind. I banged the table and kicked a briefcase and slammed out of the room and and just felt like this system, I, I knew it was restricted and I, I knew uh, it wasn't fair, but what we saw today is just, uh, it was disgusting. And the fact that uh, the man from Milwaukee that uh, put this suspension on me with, with not one bit of evidence, something I didn't do, and he doesn't have the courage to come look at me in the eye and tell me this is why I did 211, I shouldn't serve one inning. And this guy should come to my to our city. I know he doesn't like New York. I love this city. I love being a Yankee. My daughters grew up in New York. And for this guy, the embarrassment that he's put me and my family through, and he doesn't have the courage to come see me and tell me, this is why I'm going to destroy your career. So you blew up when the arbitrator, Horowitz, made the ruling the commissioner is not coming. That's when you exploded. Uh, uh, so you I, got the definitive word that he was not coming to this process, right? I, I exploded uh, much worse than Paul O'Neill on any of his explosions with the coolers. Uh, I, I was very upset. I, I probably overreacted, but that's just it came from the heart. And this has been a very difficult process. Mike, if I may, Alex, did yeah, not, Alex did not overreact in the slightest. There is no legal form in the United States where a man does not get to face his accusers. Well, this is not a legal forum, though. This is, right, this is, we know that. There's no rules here, right? Yeah, that interview, it's very funny as a mix of both, like, live reaction, awkward moments, Mike Francesa seeming to give earnest personal advice to (laughs) A-Rod, but then seeming to, like, accidentally touch on some hard questions. It's a pretty great interview. It's really like A-Rod at his most raw... Um, he's also there with a lawyer who who sort of gives weird, seemingly ill-advised legal advice in the, in the interview. And yeah, I think Francesca gets a lot of heat for this interview because he, and it is, he, he doesn't do a great job. He doesn't really even ask Bo- Alex directly like about his relationship with Bosch until 35 minutes into a 40 minute interview. But it's also hard to blame him. Like Alex just shows up and then like on a random weekday and it's clear like Francesca doesn't even have notes or any prep work done for the interview. So like what's he supposed to do? 